вчора Данило. Я тільки нагадаю, що професор Бухінгер народився в 69-му році у Відні. Він з 95-го по 2007 рік був асистентом в Інституті літургійних наук у Відні. З 2008-го року він є професором літургійного богослов'я в університеті Рекінсбург. Він є членом організації «Соціалітас літургіка». Основними зацікавленнями його є рання історія церкви, патристика, літургіка і, зокрема, оригіністичні студії. Його дисертація була написана про Пасху в Оригена, але окрім того, він є цікавий тим, що опублікував найдавнішу відому гомілію на псалми, яка існує, і з нею можна тепер ознайомитися. Крім того, в нього є багато публікацій, які стосуються початку чи початків витоків літургійного року, зокрема, на джерелах Єрусалимської літургії. Бо, як ми всі знаємо, більшість свят зародилися саме в святому місті Єрусалимі і звідти вже поширилися на інші частини християнського світу. Сьогодні сьогоднішня лекція буде присвячена святкуванню Пасхи, конкретніше пасхального триднев'я в ранньо єрусалимських джерелах, а саме в вірменських лекціонарях і в Етерії. Гаральд Бітезер. Дякую дуже багато, що ви знову мене тут. І, в факті, It should be Daniel Galatza who should speak on this topic uh, because uh, he is really on the cutting edge of research in the, in, in the liturgy of Jerusalem and uh, perhaps you had already the opportunity to have seen his new book. It's, uh, it came out just a few months ago on, lit on liturgy and Byzantinization in Jerusalem in Oxford University Press. So um, if you wanted to hear real, real research on Jerusalem, you should, uh, should, should ask Daniel, and I'm sure you will have the opportunity to hear him, him on that. And I feel almost a bit embarrassed to speak in front of such a master, because I'm, uh, not, really doing, um, I'm not really doing research in, 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 in Jerusalem. I'm a bit trying to systematize things, uh, but, 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 but I have little, little original to offer on Jerusalem, and I feel more uneasy than with the other topics which I had the privilege uh, to present here. Origin was a topic in which I did research, and also this morning on, the, on, 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 on Amphilochius and on the questions of, of the Epiclesis and the Eucharistic theology, um, I feel a bit more at home in a sense. Uh, but when we first corresponded about what to do, um, the option was to have one pat patristic theme in the, in the strict sense of the word and one more, uh, more liturgical theme. And uh, of course I'm not a Byzantine liturgical historian um, and um, uh, the fields in which I'm more proficient in, in, in Western liturgy is probably of limited interest, would have been of, of limited interest um, uh, to, to, to you. Uh, so uh, we agreed upon going back to the common roots um, and with the words of the liturgy of St. James uh, and according to Cyril of Alexandria, um, the Council of, of Constantinople, to the mother of all churches, both Eastern and Western. Um, um, so um, what I want want to offer with a bit trembling and fear because I'm sure that all of you have heard this several with, times with Jerusalem. Um, several times um, um, in your introduction into liturgy and the liturgical history and liturgical year um, is shedding a bit light on what I think is most important what we can learn from sources which are always worthwhile re-reading um, and uh, what I provided in terms of material, uh, as I said yesterday, uh, my, my method always is uh, to, to invite to re-read sources 
whether you have read them 100 times, it's always worthwhile, or whether you have read them only once or twice long ago, so it's all the more worthwhile to go back. So you have a bilingual reader of Holy Week and Easter according to Egeria. I apologize, there are some typos left um, because it was scanned with an OCR um, and it was proofread, but, 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 but not thoroughly enough. Thoroughly enough, so that's what happens. Um, and uh, the other table is uh, an English translation of a, of a table which is not innov innovative in any sense, but I made this for a publication which you find on my publication list on, 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 on Holy Week in Jerusalem. Um, a synopsis which I find helpful um, of uh, Egeria with the so-called Armenian lectionary, which probably is familiar to most of you, but I'll come to that in a minute. Um, so at least you, what you can take with you if, uh, is, 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 is um, a systematization of, um, of, of the backbone of Holy Week in late antique Jerusalem. Um, my method in, in this analysis is more theological than historical. Um, of course, it's always a bit of history in, in, in involved because um, I'm convinced that uh, the second half of the fourth century uh, was an era of really categorical innovations in liturgical history. Of course, the Constantinian turn is a much debated concept and, it's, uh, and the relation between continuity and discontinuity, uh, especially in liturgy, um, after um, uh, the, the church um, had the first step freedom uh, of cult and then uh, became official state cult under, under Theodosius, um, um, one can dispute how continuity and discontinuity uh, relate, um, but I think it's quite clear that the idea of festal cycles celebrating moments of salvation history in two cycles, Christmas uh, or Easter cycle plus Christmas cycle, third cycle is different and of, of the Santorale of course, it has different motivations, um, is not simply an organic, as it were, unfolding of the old kernel of a synthetic Pascal theology, but a really categorically new layer of totally new spirituality um, triggered by pilgrim spirituality um, um, in the Holy Land uh, of pilgrims who went there with a Bible in hand and asked where was this and where was that and uh, of course Traditions were identified, some have a longer tradition, but um, uh, when Palestine became a sacred landscape, um, um, and one could not only go through the Holy Land with a Bible in hand and ask where was this and where was that, but one can also make an attempt in uh, celebrating according to time and place, and not only place. Um, I'll come to that in a minute, because uh, you all know that the chronology of the New Testament and especially of the of the Passion narrative um, is, is is not a simple chronology, but uh, but, but one has to harmonise um, the contradicting chronologies of the Gospel to get a coherent system. Um, and uh, I'm I'm quite convinced that 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 this was a totally new and categorically uh, new theological reasoning which gave rise to, 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 uh, to the origin of most of the feasts we know apart from Easter and apart from celebrating certain martyrs um, um, and there is a bit of historical interest involved because we can see that the fully fledged liturgical year which turns up exactly in Jerusalem in the, in the 380s and in other homilies, contemporary in the, in the end of 4th, beginning of 5th century, um, where one can see how this concept spreads very, very quickly throughout the Christian Ecumene. Uh, but already in our oldest witnesses, we can see, as it were, the cracks um, uh, of a history of growth and of development. And of course, it's the same methodology we apply in biblical criticism, repetitions, are always um, an indicator that something happened, and especially tensions um, 
um, rest of contradictory or at least uh, elements which are in tension uh, with each other. But primarily, I think, um, uh, the question which we have to pose to ourselves and then those who are preaching uh, every time when one preaches uh, at, festal, at festal occasions is um, how to construct theologically or how to um, discern a festal theology and how to overcome a simple concept of a particularizing mystery play just following stations of Jesus' passion and resurrection. Uh, because liturgy is more than a mystery play um, um, uh, or a theatrical uh, staging, but liturgy is, of course, and that's fundamental, uh, but it has to be fleshed out in theology, and we can observe that in historical theology, and it's a challenge for all of us and you who are active in uh, in, in, in the proclamation, um, festal proclamation, festal sermons, festal homilies, um, um, how liturgy is a representation, an actualization, um, and a commemoration through communication of salvation history. Um, and in a sense, of course, since we have liturgical feasts, mimesis is a central category uh, uh, to imitate. Um, according to place in Jerusalem and time everywhere else, um, um, uh, steps of salvation history. But mimesis is a medium of anamnesis. And in liturgical scholarship, it um, has been opposed occasionally to say, well, mimesis is, is, um, is a kind of, 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 of decadent um, innovation of, 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 of the fourth century. Um, I'm convinced mimesis is, of course, not op opposed to anamnesis, but a way of anamnesis, and so one could also say anamnesis through mimesis. And what, what I always propose when we read 4th uh, century, 5th century Jerusalem and other texts is to pay attention to the implicit mechanisms, as it were, of the strategies, uh, explicit or implicit, of these liturgies, how they represent and actualize uh, the celebrated mystery, um, uh, because the natural, as it were, gravitation of piety has two developments which you can observe in every parish every year uh, if you don't pay attention to it. People tend to particularize salvation history then was that, and then was that, and then was that, and then we go to the next station, and then was that, and materialization uh, of, uh, of piety, which means clinging to material objects um, um, uh, used in liturgy. Um, and of course, every festival, the, the, the sheer idea of a festival cycle has the seed of particularization because you cannot say everything at the same time in every moment, so you have to particularize. And since uh, liturgy is communica bodily communication and it's in time and space, it always has a material aspect and communication is not, uh, we do not communicate as, as, as sheer spirits uh, to each other by te telepathy, um, but it's, it's a bodily communicative action, so it is material by definition and by force uh, in this world um, until uh, and before the, 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 the beatific vision. Um, but the gravity of, of piety uh, goes to focusing on, uh, on objects used in liturgy, be it the sacramental matter or be it secondary objects. And we shall see that palm branches or whatsoever uh, change their way of use over time, and we can observe that in late antiquity, and that's not only of historical interest for me, but it's a kind of active immunization to observe what happens over the centuries if you don't pay attention, or if you pay attention to the historical sources, you see what happens um, to piety um, uh, also in contemporary times. Um, and it's always I think uh, the worth theological strife if we are, do not limit ourselves to just observing as historians, but most of us are uh, uh, theologians, um, to not only observe but counterbalance the 
quasi natural, as it were, decomposition of what Cyril of Jerusalem, in his famous quota quotation uh, from Catechesis 10 something, I think it is, Ameriston Garestin Sevea, which means unseparable, unsplittable, is the piety. Um, uh, so that's that's what I'm struggling uh, with uh, whenever I talk about uh, about festal liturgies and and one field to observe that is late antique Jerusalem. Um, Kenneth Stevenson, the deceased Anglican bishop, one of the great liturgists of the last century, um, distinguished three pieties in his famous book Jerusalem Revisited, which was originally spiritual conferences he gave um, to a convent, but it's still worth reading for theological reasons. And it's a bit too schematized, uh, but he distinguished three pieties which can be observed in the, in the history of Paschal uh, celebration. The oldest and most pristine one, unitive, to celebrate the mystery of salvation as one theological movement. I come to that, if we have time, uh, when I comment on the, on, on the readings of the Paschal Vigil. Um, if you ask people what Easter is about, um, most of your parish, um, parish attend church attendants would say Easter is the feast of the resurrection of Christ, and that's of course not wrong, but it's much too little, as you as theologians are certainly very aware, uh, because uh, Easter, if you read any, not, not any, but, 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 but most of the, of the patristic Easter sermons, um, or... Um, uh, I haven't to tell you, but I have to tell Western students, um, 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 read Byzantine hymnography. Um, it's not about be Christ being ri uh, be just Christ being raised, uh, but it is uh, the restoration of fallen humankind, fallen man, um, um, fallen humankind, uh, not just to, 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 uh, back... Uh, back on earth, as it were, uh, but the restor uh, restoratio melius, the famous scholastic formulation, the restoration to a better state. So um, uh, it's a, in a way the Easter egg, as it were, if you have the three level worldview heaven, earth, and, and, and underworld. Um, man was created on earth in paradise. If you read further than the first two chapters of the Bible, it's clear where it ended with fall. And, and therefore man, humankind, is in bondage and in, in Hades, and, and the descent of Christ in the incarnation through the death to burial to the Hades means evacuating Hades, lifting fallen humankind um, in heaven, so that's the move movement from, from uh, from um, Melito on, and, and you have it in all homilies, and you're very, very well aware of this. So that's what Stevenson calls unitive piety of, um, of Easter. And the resurrection is a relatively unimportant moment of, the, of this. Um, and um, I, it's not my topic today, but I sifted through homilies of the 4th, of the 5th century, and the, the Easter morning Gospels turn up very occasionally in the homilies, and they are not central for conveying the message of Easter. Um, the second piety um, is the one uh, we are talking about since we have feasts. This is re what Stevenson calls rememorative, which means exactly the piety of uh, celebrating certain historicizing uh, moments in separate feasts and the sheer occurrence of Easter Sunday, uh, for example, detached from the vigil is such a feast and of course the whole of Holy Week and the 40th day after and the 50th day after and the same with the Christmas cycle. Um, and the third piety um, Kenneth Stevenson uh, distinguishes is beyond unitive and rememorative representational and he uses this word for a piety which we find already in Nigeria um, to represent certain elements in material objects so the, the materialization the increasing materialization of, part, of piety and of course this is a bit too schematic but um, um, but it's still helpful to, to categorize what's happening um, and I find, as a theologian, not as a historian, but as a theologian, um, the fundamental question of dealing with feasts of the liturgical year is of balancing 
the synthetic, as it were, unitive, as Stevenson says, tendencies of theology and the, as it were, um, centrifugal tendencies, the particularizing tendencies which result in, in the long run in the way of the cross or a mystery play as you can observe in many Western um, late medieval and, 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 and early modern times that, 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 that you have theater plays which arise from piety, theater plays um, about, ab about, the, the, uh, about passion history and uh, perhaps the last step of that would be Mel Gibson's The Passion of Christ um, just staging a, a, a historicizing event um, second very brief preliminary remark um, the sources we are uh, talking about you, you are well known to all of you um, one can distinguish and we have in Jerusalem the happy situation, the fortunate situation that we have all kinds of sources, almost all kinds of sources we wish to have to reconstruct liturgy. We have first liturgy descriptive sources, liturgies which uh, the sources which describe describe liturgy, Egeria above all, but uh, but also other occasional hints in, in pilgrims' literature, in monastic literature of, Pal of late antique Palestine. So they are particularly. Um, um, helpful for us because they are not the insider's view, they are the interested describer's view so therefore liturgy descriptive sources one could say but we have also the um, um, the, the, the complementary um, liturgy prescriptive sources so we have the liturgical order not particularly from the time of Egeria but we have uh, Egeria, by the way, 381 to 384, it's f familiar to most of you, so uh, 380s, basically. One generation later, from the four third, f between 417 and 439, we have not a Greek source, which is lost, but medieval manuscripts in Armenian translation, which very, very confidently can be uh, said to have translated a Greek original of the years between 417 and 439 um, uh, because uh, Cyril and John of Jerusalem are already in the Sanctorale as deceased, so it's post-417. The, 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 the relics of, 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 of St. Stephen are already discovered. This again brings us to post-417 and before 439 uh, because uh, St. Stephen's Church is not yet built um, where nowadays the, um, the, um, the Ecole Biblique Française of the Dominican Fathers is. Uh, so that's the time slot for the Armenian Lectionary. And that gives the stations, the localization, the datation, so the, the, the liturgical date, the readings which are written out in full but not, uh, not, not edited by the editor um, with, uh, with the Psalms, Unfortunately, um, we are not sure if uh, at that point already there were non-biblical chants. Personally, I am still a bit skeptical for, for reasons which I don't want to discuss now for the sake of time. But we have late antique hymnography from Jerusalem. Um, um, in the Jerusalem Tropologion, we have even the word now attested in a papyrus, papyrus fragment um, uh, in Georgian translation. Um, the so-called older Yadgari, and we have of course further Georgian sources referred to as Georgian lectionary, which does it roughly the same like the Armenian lectionary, it's a kind of synaxarium plus lectionary um, um, in various manuscripts three of them quite comprehensive, none of them complete and about two dozens of more or less um, fragments, some several pages, some, 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 some very short fragments. There's all, also a Greek source. Um, um, so we have, we can observe how things develop between the late 4th and early 7th century, roughly speaking. Then we have a certain leap until the Byzantinized um, uh, sources, so-called typical of the Anastasis of the 12th century, perhaps witnessing 10th century, uh, but I'll not speak of that, uh, about that. Not only because it's not, not my competence, uh, but also because um, that's already um, not the pure Hagia Polite late antique liturgy, but a heavily Byzantinized um, 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 liturgy. But what that means in, in concrete terms, you can read in, in Daniel's, uh, Daniel Galatz's new book.
Um, and the third category of sources which we have is lit uh, beyond liturgy descriptive and prescriptive is liturgy interpretative um, 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 sources. So we have a plethora of homilies uh, from Hesychius in the 5th century contemporary to the Armenian lectionary up to um, uh, up to John of Damascus, um, who was not only a monk at St. Sabas, but also a presbyter at the Anastasis um, in Jerusalem. So we, we have a lot of homilies, uh, and apart from Hesychius, who is the earliest preacher we have in Jerusalem, apart from Cyril and John with the mystagogues, uh, mystagogies and then the catechesis, um, apart from Hesychius, who, he, who is very well commented by the editor um, Obino, these homilies have found very little attention um, in scholarship, so it's worthwhile um, analyzing later preachers. Um, so, you all know Jerusalem, that's what it looked like in the 6th like century uh, with the Cardo Maximus. It's oriented to the, to, to the east, the famous Padua mosaic. Um, you have the um, the Mount of Olive would be up there. You have the Cardo Maximus, and you have turned. Uh, you have the second Cardo, as it were. You have uh, the central church of the Anastasis, which I'll point, point out in a minute. Um, um, you have the Church of Zion. You have the church, either the, that's probably the Nea church, and then here the Santa Sophia, um, uh, the Damascus Gate. So that's Jerusalem, um, or with the Ottoman walls, which you see today, um, you have the Episcopal complex of the Anastasis and then Golgotha, you have Zion, you have the Mount of Olives, you have Bethany over there, and you have the later churches of the Praetorium of, of Pilate, to which I shall come um, in, a, in, a, in a minute. Um, I think you are all aware of, 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 of the topography. And you have the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which is not a church, but a complex. Um, the rotunda around the tomb with a, with a, with a, with a cave of the, of the tomb. Um, a courtyard and the basilica, which is the, the um, uh, cathedral of Jerusalem, um, um, oriented uh, towards the tomb. And between that, the courtyard and in the not edge, a corner of the of the courtyard, the rock of Calvary, Golgotha, and you have places before and after Golgotha, and it's and um, here you have it again. Uh, you see the, the extract turned around, um, so it's not upside down. Uh, um, uh, from from the Matada map, you, map you have the facade, the entrance, the church, the basilica, the courtyard and then uh, the dome um, um, over, over the tomb. What we do not know is where the Byzantine baptistry was, and there was a room, a, a space, post crucifixion behind the cross, which was lockable, where we shall see Eucharist was celebrated on Monday Thursday, one of the three Eucharists of Monday, Monday Thursday, and Egeria is clear that it was a room, the doors of which could be locked, but we don't know where it is. We don't really have a space here in archaeology. What is in black here um, is of what we have foundation walls. We don't have much, but enough to reconstruct it. So somewhere here must have been a little space uh, which could be used liturgically. Um, yeah, um, and there is about nine points I want to make uh, as we could go through Holy Week. Um, plus one, a pre 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 preliminary one. Um, when we enter Holy Week, Egeria says, when the last week of Lent has come, and the Egeria speaks about the period of eight weeks of fasting, which is a riddle and totally erratic uh, for, for her time and for centuries, there is no good solu solution to the, pro to, to, to the problem. Um, the last week, which is Holy Week, we can 
discern in the liturgical order, which are conserved until today in all churches of East and West, uh, apart from some radical uh, Protestant or, um, orders, um, uh, differing periods before Easter, which are contemporary, which are synchronized, but uh, logically different um, uh, things, uh, entities. So the primitive or pristine Pascha consists of fasting and breaking the fast. And breaking the fast through a Eucharist, um, of course, but it's also um, really breaking the fast. And the fast can last one, two or three days or up to a whole week. And you can break the fast either after the Paschal Vigil or in the evening. Um, and that's perhaps not only a sign of decadence in early sources, but a very pristine concept of quarter decimans who fasted when the Jews feasted, which means in the evening, and therefore could logically break the fast when the, when the supper was over. So um, that's a point that, which is irrelevant for us here, uh, but um, breaking the fast on Saturday evening or early at night um, occurs in very early sources, already in Athanasius of Alexandria in the early 4th century. Um, so it may be a sign of antiquity and not of decadence, but that's not our problem here. Uh, so early celebration of Easter is very much about ascetic, as, as not asceticism, but, but ascetic practice and breaking the fast. And where you have a vigil, you, um, of course, the morning phase, not O-R, but O-U-R, the morning, the wailing phase the, 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 uh, of Easter um, is celebrated with keeping vigil. And how do you fill the vigil? Not watching movies, but reading uh, the Bible, uh, singing psalms, interrupting or um, responding to the readings with collects, with prayers. And that's the basic structure of the first part of the Paschal Vigil. Um, and then you break the fast with the Eucharist, which in the 4th century, as we shall see, um, and you know, um, has become a fully-fledged mass with, with its own liturgy of the word, which is t a totally different thing from the readings of Old Testament vigil, and that was, by the way, misunderstood by, by post-Vatican reform, which con which, which fused, and in my view, confused um, the two elements of the vigil with the Old Testament readings and the, and the New Testament uh, liturgy of the word for the, for the Paschal Mass, uh, which as such belongs to the second part of the celebration, which is the joyful one. The transition from fasting and mourning and reading and watching, um, uh, keeping vigil, to the joyful breaking of the fast in the Eucharistic celebration, which, of course, since this fourth century, also has a liturgy of the word. Um, so um, uh, that's. But the most pristine celebration of Easter means fasting and breaking the fast, and no liturgy beyond keeping watch with lessons and 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 and, 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 and psalms and prayers, and breaking the, the fast via Eucharist. And we can observe that in Alexandria of uh, Athanasius in the in the early fourth century, uh, no, the first um, um, middle middle of the fourth century, uh, the Paschal fast was established as a six-day fast, and we have other we have other sources um, from from other regions, and that Athanasius added to that the length, the six-week quadragesima of 40 days, and it's not just an expansion of the Paschal fast, uh, because the Paschal fast uh, maintains its entity, its, 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 its character, within the longer quadragesima in the Alexandrian tradition, uh, as witnessed by Athanasius and we have some other, especially from papyri, some 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 some, some later um, um, festival festival epistles of the festival letters of the sixth century, where we can see how also in Alexandria um, um, the fast was extended. But in the fourth century, it's clear it supersedes and doesn't replace 
uh, the Pascal fast, which shows that it's a new phenomenon and not just an extension. Because then the Pascal fast of the last week before uh, Easter could have disappeared. And in Jerusalem, the rubric of the Armenian lectionary after the sixth week of Lent says, here ends the canon of Lent, of, 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 of Tessera Costi, of Quadragesima. And at the beginning of Holy Week, on Monday of Holy Week, there is another rubric indicating Monday of the Paschal Fast. So, we have not only Paschal Fast superseded by, by Lent, but Lent shifted in advance, which has to do with the liturgical development of Holy Week, which we can assume happened during the Episcopacy of, of Cyril, because for indications which I don't have the time to discuss now, the best solution for the riddle how Kirill's pre-baptismal catechesis can be synchronized with liturgy is to assume that when he preached his uh, catechetical, um, 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 his catechesis, his pre-baptismal catechesis, um, there was not yet a developed Lent that was an art, um, thesis, um, among others, by Nick Russo, and I find it very plausible. But then, between 350 and 380, Holy Week was developed. The categorical innovation of, of filling that week with celebrations, as we shall see, um, that celebrates moments in the, in the life of Jesus. Um, and that fills Holy Week, which of course remains the week of the Paschal Fast, but is so strong that it shifts the six weeks of Lent in advance, so that, that the rubric says, here ends Lent. And that's not a problem as long as you count 40 days as a symbolic period. But once you begin to count how many days do I actually fast, and when do I not hold a full fast, um, then you begin to, uh, to exclude Sundays, and in the East, of course, also Saturdays, and you have to eat, and if you fast only f five days a week, and want to fast 40 days, you have to have eight weeks instead of six weeks. Well, you have six weeks, you have already the seventh week, you can add that, and then you have the, that what you know and probably practice in the Byzantine tradition, you have an added week of semi-serious fast um, uh, to make up for a whole of eight weeks. There is a letter of John of Damascus on this question um, which discusses exactly this innovation. So probably, and there are other uh, sources um, uh, in Jerusalem, and, and we can observe how uh, the fast was, was extended and it was a, a, a discussion and it's a wonderful letter so uh, perhaps it would have been a better idea to just read this letter here because I'm really embarrassed by the presence of so many distinguished colleagues and I'm now just talking about the jury which, of, of which I dream every night and know it better than, than, than I probably um, um, and, and it's really a fascinating source where you can observe that he is in favor of the eight weeks of fasting, but, but is also aware that it's not an old tradition, and, 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 and he knows other sources uh, by Basil the Great and by Athanasius and, and so forth, and quotes them and struggles with them, and it's a, it's a masterpiece of selling something as something which uh, the one who sells it knows it's not exactly that as, as he sells it. Uh, but... Um, so that's periods before Easter. Um, another question which I discuss when I, uh, when, uh, when I speak in the Western context is uh, that in the West, uh, the concept of the Triduum taken from Augustine of Christ being uh, Christ suffering, um, um, uh, having died and uh, being resurrected of Friday, Saturday and Sunday of Easter is another concept which I'm quite convinced, but that's not my point today, is not liturgically productive in late antiquity, but was taken in 20th century as a good means to structure the unity of the Easter celebration, in order not to have it fall apart. Uh, now we are very sad because Christ is suffering, and 
good for him, happy end, let's, let's be joyful that, that there was a happy end to the story, um, um, to, to, to evade this uh, bipolar, especially Western piety, and to Western students I always show, show iconography and the difference between Eastern and Western iconography of Easter and, 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 and the di difference between an Anastasis icon and, 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 and the Western particularizing Gothic uh, piety of having compassion with Christ I don't know what exact, but, but, but I don't want to polemicize about late, 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 late medieval Western piety, um, um, and, uh, and and the bi and against the bipolar, as it were, piety. But that's not my topic today. Um, for everybody, since the later fourth century, it's taken for granted that if you open the Bible, you find Holy Week there. But it's not as trivial as um, um, some of our students, at least in the West, assume. Uh, so very briefly, you have to harmonize the Gospels, because you don't get a, a, a Palm Sunday um, just from the Synoptic Gospels, which are read on the day. Uh, so Egeria says, Lazarus Saturday is the sixth, sixth day before Easter, uh, before the Pascha. Um, and that's a riddle. Um, that's Johannine, uh, that's uh, Johannine chronology. And Egeria says the proclamation or the annunciation of Pascha is read, and it's clear she means John 12. Well, the Last Supper is described uh, by, the, by, by, by the Synoptic Evangelists as Passover meal uh, in Matthew 26, 17, and, and, and the Synoptic Parallels. And of course, that parallels John 13, which you all know has no institution narrative, but the washing of feet. But it's the same. It's the same event. Although in the gospel chronology, it's shifted one day because it's not the eve of Pesach, uh, but the evening of Pesach in John. Um, um, when uh, um, uh, vice versa, um, vice versa. It's 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 the evening before the eve of Pesach. In the Synoptics, um, Easter is, um, the, the Last Supper is, is the Pesach meal, which means it's celebrated on the e evening of the 14th of Nisan, whereas in John, um, Christ is already crucified at the period when, at the time uh, when, 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 when the lambs are slaughtered and identified with a, with a quotation from you sh uh, shouldn't break his, bone, um, his bones. Um, so, either going back six days reduces the concept um, uh, by one, or we have both chronologies uh, um, in the Hagia Polite liturgy, um, and it's not uh, only as um, the Armenian lectionary states, the first day of the old Pascha, which means the old Pascha at which the Eucharist was celebrated, but perhaps it extends to Friday in the Johannine sense. So we don't know how this reasoning came about exactly, but what we know that on the morrow, on the following day, after John 12.1, the, the story of the unction uh, in Bethany, uh, John tells the story of the entry into Jerusalem. Um, and that, of course, parallels Matthew 21, which is not dated in the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, you couldn't tell that's Palm Sunday um, um, by, by the Gospel of Matthew. But, you, but from the Johannine chronology, you can date the entry into Jerusalem on Matthew 21, uh, on, on, on the Sunday, um, six days before the Friday of the Passion. Um, and then, of course, you can add further elements and you get the gospel readings of Holy Week as uh, they are mostly preserved in the Byzantine tradition until today. Um, on Tuesday you get the speeches which are two days before, uh, before Pascha, the, the eschatological discourse, and that's why they are read on Tuesday in Holy Week. Well, and I think that's it, because, because the rest is clear, I mean that that uh, the resurrection takes place on Sunday and the eighth day and so forth. You need to harmonize anything. Uh, there is concrete. Well, what you have to fit in is the farewell discourses uh, 
after the Last Supper in John, and in fact, we, you know, because you do it in the Byzantine Rite until today, um, that these discourses are read in the vigil of Good Friday or the night after, uh, after, after Monday, Monday Thursday. So, um, that's the overall framework, the skeleton as it were, and I just want to point out very few elements I find noteworthy in the reading cycle, um, in the reading orders of, 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 of late antique Jerusalem. The first is um, Lazarus Saturday um, at the Lazarium. Um, Egeria just says there are hymns and antiphons according to the day and also lectures according to the day and the Annunciation of Easter before dismissal of which we don't know if it's really the reading of the Eucharist as it is uh, from the Armenian lectionary on identifiable well, what does that mean according to time and place the psalm is identified, that's, um, that's always good if you have an antiphon, because it shows us for which reason the, the, the particular psalm was chosen, and the antiphon is the salvation from the pit, the Psalm 29 in the Septuagint, or 30 in the, in the, in the, in the, in the Hebrew, um, um, uh, says, um, I praise you, Lord, because you, because you, you have uh, lifted me up from the, and, and, and from, from, from the pit, and, and I, w I was like the one going down to the pit, and and, and, uh, and, and I shall dance because you, uh, even you know this song. So, and the second um, reading is uh, the general reading on the of First Thess <coughs> Thessalonians on the resurrection. Brethren, I, I don't want to let you unclear about the fate of the death of, of the dead, and so it's not suitable to to the date, but it's connected with the place, because it's the place in, in the house of Lazarus. So we can observe that certain readings in the, uh, in the Hagia Polite order, as, by the way, in the Roman lectionary, are tied to a given place in the city, regardless of uh, at which day you go there. We shall see another example on Palm Sunday. It's connected to the space or place and not to the time. Uh, whereas the gospel of the day is the one which fits six days before the Passover. The same can be observed in the readings of Palm Sunday. The gospel is, of course, the gospel of the day, uh, Matthew 21, which can be dated to the day because it's parallel as uh, John 12. Um, Ephesians, the hymn or canticle, or however you want to call it, the hymn, hymnic, as it were, passage of, of the anachephaliosis, of the, of the restoration of all, that's a suitable, uh, suitable reading uh, for the beginning of Holy Week because it gives a synthesis of all. In the West, we have a similar text from Philipp, uh, for Philippians 2, the... the, 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 the um, um, but the psalm has nothing to do with, uh, we, uh, well, it, has, it can be read um, 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 in view of the entry of Jesus in Jerusalem, but it's a psalm which is read every time a station is celebrated on the Mount of Olives, and it says, the mountains shall rejoice before the Lord uh, because he comes or when he comes, um, Psalms 97, 98. Um, so that's Whenever you are on the Mount of Olive, you sing a psalm, the mountains shall rejoice before the Lord. And of course, it has a spe specific resonance on this day because the coming of God is identified on this day with the coming of Jesus um, in, um, in, 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 uh, into Jerusalem. So the eschatological coming of the Old Testament God um, to judge um, the world um, is identified with the concrete coming of, 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 of Jesus um, in his going uh, ent entry of the city. You are all aware, speaking of Palm Sunday, next point, um, that the particular 
commemoration is the gospel of the day and if you ask people again what is celebrated on the Sunday before Easter everybody would say the entry into Jerusalem or we would even have Palm Sunday and at least in, 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 in Greek terminology it's, it's clear it's Tom Beon, um, and in the West it's, it's about waving palms and not only waving palms but taking palms at home and do something um, as late antique pilgrims would say take away blessing um, uh, means take away a blessed object uh, that's the terminology of the 6th century pilgrim, pilgrim of, of Piacenza um, but when we read Egeria Egeria is very clear everything is done from night until dawn as every Sunday and what is done every Sunday the resurrection vigil so Palm Sunday is in first place Palm uh, Sunday and not Palm Sunday. And then she says, and she needn't tell us because, uh, 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 but, but you can observe, and every date which has a mimetic content, Egeria tells everything is done as usual, which means Eucharist, the celebration of the whole of the Christ event. And in the evening she, 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 she doesn't um, refrain from telling, it may be late after the afternoon service, but everything is done as usual, the, the, the Luzonarium, the Vespas are, are celebrated, which again connect uh, with the whole of the Christ event, of course, because uh, Luzonarium per definitionem means hailing Christ as the, as the light which doesn't um, um, set. Um, um, um. So, synthetic, synth synthetically speaking, Palm Sunday is Sunday in the first and second and last place and the specific commemoration is only inserted. But you can observe through the sources how the particular content becomes more and more important. One of the manuscripts says Sunday, day of, of, of branches, and adds Oloromen. I, Evlochemenos, that's a, that's a um, in, 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 uh, um, uh, kind of transcribing the, uh, the, the psalm of the day, uh, uh, praised be or uh, blessed be he who comes in the name of the Lord, Psalm 118, uh, which is staged. In the Georgian lectionary, in, in, in Nigeria, you have people tearing palms and um, uh, waving palms, so it's, as it were, a requisite of the liturgical communication in the situation of the communication. In the Georgian lectionary, there are not only palm branches which are used in liturgy to represent uh, the commemorated event, but the palm branches are blessed and it's said they lie on the altar since uh, f from the first Vespa song. So you see the materialization. And in the typicon of the, um, of the Anastasis, the so-called, it's an olive tree um, which is carried around, probably which becomes a kind of symbol of Christ because it's planted uh, or erected on Golgotha at the end. Um, and the rubric, or the, or the, it's, it's, the description says, and as soon as the service is, uh, uh, is over, the people come and spoil it. And, and that's what you can observe also in Western piety. So the materialization, that you don't only use material objects to represent uh, the, the element, but that the element becomes blessed and becomes a holy thing, which, which you can do all pious and sometimes less pious things, uh, apotropaic use, which you can observe in, 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 in popular piety. And, and, and I don't want to blame that or ridicule that, but it's the natural gravity of of, of, of piety. And in the West we have exactly the same. A little later, um, the blessing of palm branches and other things occurs from the 8th century on, when you don't just use things in liturgy. Yeah, big leap. Um, um, Tuesday evening we have this gospel of, 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 of the farewell, uh, no, no, the, the eschatological discourse. Um, which is mimetic uh, because it's on that day and it's in a special place. It's in the cavern, in the in the in the in the in the, the cave um, under the Eleona Church, in the crypt, which is a pre-Constantinian, probably well, Judeo-Christian is always a difficult term, but it's it's a, that's one of the few traditions uh, which very very with great likelihood go back before the 4th century because um, uh, we have it also in apocryphal sources 
Eusebius already knows a tradition which was received at his time at the beginning of the first century in the apocryphal acts of John um, we have um, an instruction of the disciples in this cave um, so that's, that's a quite old tradition and that it's highly mimetic can be seen from, from, from a particular feature the bishop stands and reads the gospel and usually of course the bishop doesn't read the gospel um, um, it's the deacon's office uh, but in this situation it's clear it's representational because he is reading in the person of Christ the farewell, uh, not the farewell discourse he's reading um, the, um, uh, the, the, the eschatological um, discourses um, jumping to Holy Thursday um, we have interestingly already in Nigeria two Eucharistic celebrations mm -hmm. uh, we are in chapter either if you just turn the page to, in, in, on, on, on the, in, in the synopsis or um, go to um, paragraph um, 35 Again, it's a highly mimetic day. And the Jiria says, Thursday is like the other days from cockroach to the morning in the Anastasis. And you can read the whole of Egeria. And, and that's once I put myself the question, I checked it, and it's really all events um, uh, which have mimetic celebrations have the commentary. And that's all the more um, uh, valuable for us um, because Egeria is not a mad liturgist who wants to, to, to repeat like a teacher in, liturgy, in, a, in a liturgy class that's important to have to maintain the synthetic elements but she's an observer, a pious observer but, 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 but she has no agenda um, or maybe implicit agenda uh, we, we don't know why, why she wrote this but, but probably not yet to, to tell her fellow uh, sisters or fellow Christians in the West you should do that like this probably not in Nigeria um, so that's really valuable and we have the usual service in the afternoon uh, with readings which we have on every fast day um, usually on Wednesdays and Fridays during the year and during Lent particularly uh, but also on, 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 on Monday Thursday as a fast day there is a reading service at the ninth hour, but because the program has grown fuller, it's a bit anticipated, and it's filled with particular um, um, readings which pertain to the Eucharist or to the Passion, Genesis 22, the, the sacrifice of Abraham, Isaiah 61, which is a very general reading about announcing the, 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 the year of blessing of the Lord, um, Zion is named, um, but, but it's very general. But then, from Acts, looking back on the betrayal of Judas, which of course pertains to the day, and also Psalm 40, uh, 54, which also says, um, as an antiphon, uh, my friend has, uh, has, has forsaken me. So, uh, so that's typological. And then comes a Eucharistic celebration. Um, which at least um, in, in the Armenian lectionary is clearly Eucharistic uh, in, in the reading program is it, it's Psalm 22, 23 you prepare a table in front of me and the chalice is, 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 is your chalice is wonderful in the, in, 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 in the Septuagint uh, version um, the institution narrative from Paul and the Last Supper, inclusive its preparation, from Matthew. But, and probably this is the oldest Eucharist, because it's celebrated in the Basilica. It's not on Zion, for example, um, in the upper, in the, in the Cenacle. So it's a pristine element of celebrating important things in the same church, and not mimetically somewhere where they would pertain. That's a secondary movement. Then comes the second Eucharist, which perhaps is also second in terms of history, which is not even on Zion, but behind the cross. Um, and that's a theological, amimetic, non-mimetic choice of the, of the station, because Eucharist and cross pertain to each other, and that doesn't need any liturgy of the words to explain, and 
it's not only because we already had a Eucharist in the afternoon um, on that day, but we have other testimonies in the West. Augustine speaks of an evening Eucharist in, 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 on, on Monday, Thursday, and the earliest Roman sources have no liturgy of the word on Monday, Thursday, because the, the day explains itself. You need not have a liturgy of the word. In Jerusalem, we have a liturgy of the word in the, in the first mass, but we don't have one in the second mass. Mm -hmm. And only one generation later, one feels the need to go to the place where uh, the, uh, the, the, the institution of the, the Last Supper is commemorated, to go to Zion, where the tradition of the Cenacle clearly is established by the time of Egeria, because other events which in the Gospel are, um, um, are told to have happened there, Easter evening, eighth day after Easter, um, and, and above all, Pentecost, are celebrated on Zion. So, um, so she has the tradition of the Cenacle on Zion, but there's not yet at that time a, a celebration of the Eucharist on Monday, Thursday. Sometime between 380 and 439, one feels the need to go to Zion and, has, and inserts a third Eucharist, and one is not very creative. One repeats the liturgy of the word from the afternoon, just substituting uh, the Gospel of Matthew with the synoptic parallel from Mark. Next element, I have the clock in mind, and um, um, uh, next element is the vigil from Holy Thursday to, um, to, to Good Friday, which is much more familiar to you than to, to, to my Western students. To my Western students, I always have to explain that this vigil is important. Um, it doesn't exist in this form in the West, um, I don't think in any right, uh, but it comes up in popular piety uh, through the ages, but has no liturgical service. The vigil of the office of, 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 of Good Friday is something different. It's not a mimetic vigil, keeping watch over the night um, between betrayal and condemnation and crucifi crucifixion. But what one can observe when one reads um, uh, each year, not carefully, you just have to read her um, and, and, and make your thoughts about it, and, and I apologize if, again, if that's all too simplistic, um, it's not simply a way of the cross. It's not going from the Garden of Geth Gethsemane uh, to the House of Caiaphas, to the, to the Praetorium of Pilate, um, um, to the cross. But what do we have? We have a reading of John 13 to 18, a service of psalmody, which is important because psalms are not only applied exegesis, Typological, um, uh, typo typologically chosen psalms uh, who talk about the suffering one and interprets the, the suffering of Jesus, but because they are sung with antiphons, they enable those who celebrate this liturgy, and at that time it's clearly uh, the people who respond in, in the antiphons, uh, to identify, so you have a double identification. Uh, when it says, my friend has forsaken me, or my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, or uh, they, they, qu uh, they qu quench my thirst with, with, with vinegar, it's not only applying the psalm to Christ, but identifying as, uh, as people, not only with the prototyp pro prototypical situation of the psalm, but also um, um, identifying with Christ so celebrating this kind of liturgy and mutatis mutandis, you have similar things in the Western proper of Gregorian chant, um, um, means in a, in a sense actualizing baptismal spirituality. Because if baptismal spirituality means dying and rising with Christ, you can say, well, that happens in baptism theologically if you read Paul, but it happens liturgically when you... Um, uh, when you um, 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 celebrate um, um, this liturgy and identify with psalms which are exegetical typologies of Christ, interpret, um, uh, interpret the gospel, but also actualize them for the believers. That's one thing which I always want to point out. The second thing is that originally 
all four passion narratives are read, all four canonical gospels. I think it's the case in the Byzantine liturgy until today. Yes. Um, um, but you can observe uh, already through the three manuscripts of the Armenian lectionary and all the more in the, in the Georgian lectionaries in plural, um, um, that pericopes are either abbreviated or in one case even prolonged um, to account to giving an account, a subsequent account of the story. Um, and one can see from the stations in the manuscripts of the Armenian lectionary, which are not, uh, not matching in, in the three manuscripts, how the identification of certain places of the way between Gethsemane and, and, uh, and the cross, the house of Caiaphas and the Praetorium of Pilate are identified and there may be a circle between identifying the place and adapting the liturgy by shortening or occasionally uh, in, uh, lengthening the pericopes read to account for a kind of, um, a kind of, 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 of way of the cross. Um, that's an interesting uh, thing to observe. You all know that Good Friday uh, consists of the veneration of the cross, which is not a liturgy in the strict sense of the word, but a collective act of piety. But there are no readings, no chants. Um, it's just a synchronized collecti collective act of, uh, liturgically speaking, an act of, 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 of relic piety connected with the day, but not a liturgy proper. That's important because um, in the West, from Carolingian times on, it becomes part of the service, which is beautiful and has beautiful texts, um, but, it's, um, 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 but originally it's extra-liturgical, in a sense. It's always difficult to, to, to say liturgical, extra-liturgical, because it's a craterology, uh, craterology and every craterology is, is, is challengeable and disputable. Um, but the real service as such is again mimetic, filling the three hours on which Christ, through which Christ hang on the cross between noon and, um, and, 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 and the ninth hour, and to read, as Egeria says, from the Gospels, uh, the Passion narrative, um, first of the Psalms, where they speak from the Passion, then from the Apostle, uh, and from the, post, from the Prophets, where they speak of the Lord that he should suffer or would suffer. And she says, in order to convey to the people that nothing has, be, has happened which was not prophesied, and nothing was prophes not prophesied, uh, or nothing was prophesied which was not totally fulfilled. So that's the locus classicus for typological choice of non-gospel readings. And of course, this is constitutive for any festal liturgy, and in a Byzantine context, one hasn't to argue that. In the West, um, typological um, application of the Bible has become more suspect. Um, so I spare this footnote here, but and that, that it's constitutive for festal liturgies to read the Old Testament and non-gospel New Testament texts in a typological way. But if you pay attention to the, to the concrete conte contents, it's much more than mere typologies of the Passion, but it's also interpretation, it's highly theological texts from the, from, from the Pauline literature or even from, from, Hebrew, from Hebrews, a very sophisticated cultic theology, the, from Romans, the pro propitiation, um, and so on, and it also includes prophecies of uh, universal restoration, uh, for example, in the, in the reading from Zechariah. So it's universal and not merely um, um, typological. And again, you have eight psalms, some of which are already quoted in the Gospels, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, Psalm 21, uh, Psalm 30, in your hands I commend my spirit, um, uh, but also others which apply um, the division of the clothes, um, the, um, uh, the false testimonies which stand up, the vinegar, um, and so on, um, which are open for identifying with Christ. The probably most sophisticated one is Psalm 87, um, uh, I am free among the dead, which is a 
philologically speaking, a misinterpretation or a disputable interpretation of an obscure Hebrew text. Chofesh Bametim, nobody knows. That's one of the famous passages where Kediv and Kere, the, 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 the consonant text and the, and the, and the, and the punctuation, uh, give differing senses and, 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 and uh, uh, one possible explanation is the Septuagint version which says he's free among the dead and what does that mean? Well, Cyril knows and says in his catechesis, uh, catechesis I think, 14, on the, on the, on the, on the, on the, on the, uh, on the article of faith of the descent of the descent of the Christology, descent into Hades, um, and says he is the only one who was who was dead, but was not was not simply dead, but was free of the, among the dead, and he says, and he was not only Evletheros um, um, in. in uh, Eleutheros in, in, in Nekois, Kei Eleutherotes Tom Nekon. And he was the one who freed the dead ones, in plural, which is of course not the psalm, but, 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 but the ratio. Um, 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 the ratio which um, Cyril gives, and therefore. The same psalm is also quoted on Saturday morning, mm -hmm. the day of Christ's descent into Hades. And there is another verse which is quoted on Saturday morning, I have become like one who has gone down to the pit. You know, Psalm 87 is the darkest of all psalms. It's the only lament in the, in the whole book of the Psalter which does not have a positive perspective. Which says, except if you take that verse from the Septuagint, free among the dead, uh, but, 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 but the text as such is dark, 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 I'm among those who go down to the pit, and my com company is only darkness. That's the end of the song. I would have two more comments, but time is over. Or I, I would say two things about the readings of the Easter Vigil and the readings of Easter Sunday. What do the Easter Vigil readings do? They are, in a sense, pristine Paschal theology. Um, you know that in most rites of East and West, the Paschal Vigil starts with Genesis 1. And most liturgists would say, well, Easter is the oldest feast and the universal feast, and that's, of course, very true. Um, and therefore, one starts with the very beginning. Um, so to be as complete as possible with, uh, with salvation history. There are also other explanations which say, well, from the 4th century on, one was very aware that one can synchronize and speculate about uh, the creation at Easter, with speculations that the full moon and the spring relate to the origin of the, of the world, and then you can even count the, 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 the creation of sun and stars on the fourth day, and so on. So you can come uh, to a reasoning that Easter must happen at, um, uh, at the date of the creation. But I think, and I take this from my colleague Clemens Leonhardt, um, that the clue is, in Jerusalem, it's not only Genesis 1 which is read, the creation, but it's read through the whole of chapter 3. So it's not only creation, but creation and fall. And that's the, setting the scene for Paschal theology in, uh, from Melito on. What is Passover? Uh, what is Pascha? It's not Christ being raised. That's part of it. But it's raising fallen mankind through the descent and ascent of Christ. And um, the other texts, and of course, um, um, uh, the, um, the other texts are typological texts relating either to the Passion of Christ, Exodus 12, the, uh, the, the Pascha, and if you're not an or originist in, in, the, in, in the sense of, of yesterday's passages, it's clear that Exodus 12 is the text, uh, prototypical Old Testament Pascha, which is a type for the Passion, um, or the sacrifice of Abraham, which is an anti-type already in Romans 8.31, where, where it said uh, God has, has not um, preserved his son, uh, but given his, his, his own son for the salvation of the world, which is, of course, opposing Christ uh, to, to Abraham. So that's typology of, of, of Jesus, 
or Jonah, the whole book of Jonah, which is of course chosen because of the chapter two um, and the application of the three days in the in the womb of uh, in, the, in, the, in the belly of the of the, of the ketos, whatever, however you translate them, that and other texts are typological of baptism. Exodus 14, of course, belongs to 12, but is it the prototype of baptism since 1 Corinthians 10. Um, um, probably two kings, second kings, the taking up of Elijah and the healing of the water by Elijah, Elijah is not only taking up a, a typology of the resurrection, but also the healing of the water in the sense of interpretation of mm -hmm. baptism. Um, um, the new covenant um, has to do with, with baptism, probably. And Joshua, the crossing of the Jordan and entering the land, is the second typology, not only going out of Egypt, which is part of, of baptism, of course, leaving sin behind, but it's also entering the promised land of the church, which is a, a motive which is around since origin, and, 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 um, as a type of baptism. The raising of the bones can be applied to both Christ and baptismal typology, and of course Daniel is again a salvation prototype um, of salvation from the from the furnace and and, and, and the resurrection story. Very last comment: uh, the readings of the day are the resurrection gospel, the the, the empty tomb. Well, that's a good choice for Easter Sunday, um, mm. and it's at the place and at the time. Although we can see that it comes in in other liturgies and homilies only very slowly in the course of the 4th and 5th cent centuries. Um, Psalm 4, uh, 64 uh, is particular to Jerusalem, praise the Lord Zion, um, that uh, has not particularly to do with the uh, resurrection, uh, but is Zion like Psalm 147, sing a, sing a new lo a song. Um, um, on, other, um, um, on other days um, with, with reference to Zion. But we also have the beginning of Acts, which includes uh, the, the Ascension, and in the evening the mimetic story of the apparition in John 20, um, uh, with the gift of the Spirit, uh, as it were, the Pentecost, the Johannine Pentecost story, um, uh, receive the spirit to, of, of whom you, you, you forgive the sins, they will be forgiven, and so on. Um, and some of my teachers were very fond of saying, well, you see, in Jerusalem, Easter Sunday celebrates the whole of the Christ event, because it starts with a reference to the entombment, it doesn't only start with the beginning of Easter morning, it has Easter morning, it has the ascension, and it has Pentecost in the Johannine, disguise that may be true heuristically and synchronically um, but may not be the reason for the choice of the pericopes um, uh, because Acts is also simply the beginning of the course reading of Acts through the whole Pentecost period so it need not be a deliberate choice of reading the ascension story of the day although I think that a genetic explanation, a theological explanation, need not be mutually exclusive. It can be a structural choice to read the beginning of the books which you read through the, throughout the period, but then be a fortunate association to have the Ascension included. Uh, but I'm skeptical that the first intention was to read the Ascension to keep the, the Christ event together, mm. as, as I learned from, from some of my teachers. And the other thing is um, that, of course, the Easter evening gospel is not primarily and deliberately in the first place integrating the gift of the Spirit on Easter Sunday to maintain the unity of the primitive Pascha, uh, but it's the reading of the day, and not only the day, but, but, but the time of the day, it, it is the evening of Easter on Zion, and fortunately contains a reference uh, to, to the gift of the Spirit. So... These are some observations, perhaps you have all made them before. I apologize if, I, if I've been boring you now, um, um, uh, but that's what I had to offer today. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for your patience. So, yeah. Thank you, Harold, for your uh, brilliant uh, um, speech on, uh, on the chair and, uh, and the beginning of the uh, 
three doom and Easter celebration. Uh, I will open the discussion. Uh, probably somebody will have some some questions because I I have, them, but I will keep my for the end. This. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. I um intrigued to hear you, you uh, mentioned that the event of Easter itself, the resurrection, is not so much of interest. Um, and I always found this kind of um, confusing, considering there are the resurrection accounts, and nevertheless, um, even here, it seems to be a later development to attempt to read them in the context, uh, apart, well, apart from the, the pericope here, Matthew, or uh, whether Matthew 28 or um, Mark, 16, the Mark, Mark 16 or John 20, but in the period afterwards, um, it's not so much an emphasis, and you mentioned um, reading Paschal homilies theme to go into this and I heard once um, a comment by Father John Baer about the fact that there's no uh, I'm not sure if it was Irenaeus of Lyon or someone saying that there's no re no need to, to dwell on these events never th because of the uh, kind of manifestation of the resurrection of Christ is the living church and therefore um, entering into rather than dwelling on these events uh, one just continues to kind of live uh, and then with readings of the, you know, Lectio Continua of John um, uh, is in your reading of texts, is this something that comes uh, across? Or yes, is it absolutely. I mean, I have an opinion on that and if I don't want to overstate it because of course um, uh, with the development of a mimetic liturgy, we have an Easter morning gospel um, in many places, uh, but we also have the contradictory evidence of the Byzantine liturgy going back to uh, this Antiochian and uh, Constantinopolitan sources, which don't care for the Easter morning gospels on, on, on Easter, because they have a more pristine um, concept of the unity of the Pentecost period, which which has a course reading not only of Acts but also of the of the Gospel of John, and therefore you start with the Gospel of John, um, with, with John one, in Jerusalem, this was probably also known, but similarly like um, the Lent was pushed advance a week because there was such a full program. Um, the course reading of the Gospel of John has been pushed backwards a week and starts on what in the West uh, for some periods was called the closing of Pascha, which means um, Bright Sunday or um, uh, uh, Easter Octave. Um, so uh, that's, in my view, structurally speaking, but, but that's reasoning which is disputable by force, um, um, a secondary development to push that uh, a week uh, back as other things are pushed a week in advance because the mimetic program is so strong um, so it's observable and reading Easter homilies it's really and of course one, one, if once one uh, thinks one did, did, um, did, um, discovers something one is always tempted to overstate it um, but, but one can push it to say that Easter Sunday, when it was invented as a mimetic feast, was a kind of homiletic vacuum. Um, um, because once you sift through the, the, the Easter homilies, you have all kinds. You have baptismal mystagogy. Um, you have Gregory of Nazianzus, who gives a Paschal Vigil homily on Easter morning, uh, uh, the famous um, Sermon 45 which would very well fit an Easter vigil, but doesn't fit Easter morning because it reads Exodus 12 and comments on the descent and ascent of Christ. Um, uh, and in the end, there are some references to identify with figures of the, of the, of, 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 of the Gospels, but, but, but 
nine tenths of the text is 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 is, is commenting on, on on Exodus 12, which is certainly not read on on, on Easter morning. Or you can use like Gregory of Nyssa's first Easter sermon um, uh, on the possibility of the resurrection of the flesh, the general resurrection, not of Christ particularly, and just take Christ as an argument uh, for the belief, for, for the congregants who obviously had their problems with the resurrection of the, fle of the flesh on anthropological grounds. Um, to, to say, well, we have an, one example for the resurrection of the flesh, which is a bit di a difficult thing to, uh, to correlate it, but, but, but that's what he does. Um, so we have all kinds of, 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 of contents on Easter Sunday, except for commenting on an Easter gospel. Uh, um, Leo the Great, we don't know if he already had an Easter morning sermon, because his sermons even are so unitive that in many cases we cannot, or in some cases we cannot even distinguish if they are Good Friday or Paschal Vigil because they comment on Exodus 12 and 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 on the synthetic Easter theology. And so, and where it first comes up is the Cappadocians, um, both in Gregory of Nyssa's long Paschal homily and in Gregory Nazian's since displaced Paschal Vigil homily, as I would call it, um, to, to overdo it, to make the point. Um, in the conclusion, there are exhortations to the faithful to identify uh, with figures of the Gospels. If you are Mary, greet the Lord. Um, if you are um, Joseph of, Mary, uh, of Arimathea, make haste to bury him. If you are Peter, run to the grave. And if you are the, the, the younger disciple, believe in him. And so, and, um, uh, so it's not as commenting on a single Easter Gospel, and there's Amphilochius on Holy Sabbath um, uh, has the same. And that's, before it occurs in other uh, regions, it occurs in Cappadocia, and they have a kind of mimetic flavor at the end of Easter homilies, and it becomes a topos among the great and Cappadocians inclusive of, 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 of Amphilochius, uh, but that's quite natural. They were Palestine pilgrims, and it was the period when the tomb of Christ uh, became important for piety, also beyond Jerusalem. And um, uh, it even says um, Gregory of Nazians' homily 45, I think, is, uh, where it says, haste to the tomb, and in one place, there is even uh, the, uh, he, one of the preachers even speaks of the open gates, um, which may refer to, to Jerusalem to, uh, to topology, topography. Um, I would have to look that up. But um, so I wouldn't say there was no importance of the story, but one can observe how it comes up in certain places before it come, becomes universal. And, and it's just astonishing how many Easter homilies were written in the 4th and 5th century which do not systematically expound an Easter morning gospel, which would be the natural choice if you have a mimetic uh, mindset. So that's... Um, and, and it's clear in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the older Paschal theology, in the, in the, in the, in the Paschal letters of, of, of Athan, festival epistles of, of uh, letters of, of Athanasius, the resurrection is hardly mentioned at all. I, I have a couple of questions, <laughs> actually. Um, the, the first one is uh, about uh, this whole thing about two uh, Eucharistic liturgies on Thursday and, and Sunday. Do you have any idea why they multiplied them? them? Yes, because I have because it, it, it it appears also in um, in our case on um, uh, Theophany and on. Yeah. Um, and on uh, the vigils of many feasts. Hmm? The vigils of many feasts. Not many, no, no, but uh, no, no, just nativity, theophany. Yeah, nativity, theophany, and, and sometimes the on uh, all the Thursday, just yeah, one liturgy. Okay, that's mm -hmm. okay. Uh, but, but sometimes on Annunciation. Uh -huh, yeah. mm -hmm. I have a, a theory on that, but mm -hmm. it's. My speculation okay. I have no source to ground it. It's really my reasoning and my trying because to, it, it to make sense. Because it appears very early yeah. And, uh, yeah. and, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And, of course, uh, one, one, it's, it's natural to look for an explanation. And 
my reasoning would be that the most pristine is the one in the afternoon, which is in the church, uh, in the main church, where everything, every important thing is celebrated, because it's the natural place for the people together, mm -hmm. and it's the natural hour. It's of, of having a Eucharist on, on, a, on a fast day. In the, in, in the afternoon, and it's attached to the regular um, um, uh, service of the ninth hour. Um, so for various reasons, I would say this, in my view, has a chance to be the, the, the original one, or the, the, the earliest one. Mm -hmm. The second is already making theological efforts uh, to have some, something special. And it's peculiar because it has no liturgy of the word, and it's a place where never ever in any other occasion a Eucharist is celebrated. Mm -hmm. It's behind the cross. But it's just on Holy Thursday. It's just on Holy Thursday. Yes. And the third, and, and definitely the third, if you can trust the sources, mm -hmm. uh, uh, is the, the evening Eucharist on Zion, um, which is mimetic. Um, mm -hmm. So you have a tendency from the re regular service, which of course gets a flavor of the day, um, through a theological duplication, to, in the third instance, and that's, that's clear, because that's, or mm -hmm. if you can trust the sources, it's clear that's, uh, that the, the increase in mimesis is secondary. And I would also say that on Easter Sunday, one can reasonably assume that the morning Eucharist is secondary to the vigil, mm -hmm. uh, because the vigil sure. has a good chance to be, uh, to, 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 to be the original service of breaking the f of, of, of fasting and then keeping vigil and and, and, and and it's interesting that it's very clear I don't know if, if that's current Byzantine practice also um, to bow them to, to prostrate for the orations during the Easter vigil which makes very clear that's the morning a part of the service and the mass is is, is, is the joyful uh, mm -hmm. second part mm -hmm. um, and You're once, changing also the clauses, uh, yeah, which was the case yeah, also in, 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 in the West, right, uh, which yeah. may be medieval, mm -hmm. but, 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 but was the case until the, uh, the last reform, mm -hmm. um, also in the West. Um, um, uh, but the colors in the West are uh, late medieval. Mm -hmm. um, um, and the morning Eucharist probably is secondary, which can be seen from the homilies, which which strive with filling the occasion. Mm -hmm. um, I would not necessarily generalize that for other feasts, um, um, because, uh, but that's open to discussion. Um, on Epiphany, um, the vigil has elements which are very likely to be taken over uh, from uh, from Easter and not vice versa, uh, because the readings <coughs> in, in Jerusalem are, to a large extent, are taken from the from the Paschal Vigil. <laughs> um, so I have no strong opinion on other feasts with vigil, uh, where uh, the vigil may be secondary. But one can speculate about about, about Epiphany. Uh, um, um, in the Roman liturgy, probably the earliest liturgy of the day, we have this same peculiarity of, of three Eucharists at Christmas. In the Roman liturgy, it's reasonable to assume that on Christmas, respectively Epiphany in Jerusalem, mm -hmm. um, um, the service of the day is the oldest one, then comes the service at midnight, and the last is the serving at dawn, uh, which has a station just uh, when you move from from mm -hmm. from Santa Maria Maggiore um, to Saint Peter's, mm -hmm. um, you go to uh, you pass Santa Santa Anastasia, and and, and you greet mm -hmm. uh, the representative of the of 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 of, 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 um, of the uh, of the uh, of the Greek emperor, and and and, and, and once you're there, you celebrate um, you celebrate the mass. Mm -hmm. um, um, but so I think one has to 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 start thinking in every instance, mm -hmm. um, and there's no general rule. But my, uh, gen if there's a general mindset I would support, I would say mimetic tendencies are often secondary to reg regular structures, mm -hmm. because that can be observed in, 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 in the Hagia Polite order. Okay. Uh, one more question, maybe nobody has?
I hope. Uh, the sec uh, second question is this uh, no. Yes, uh, th this is uh, on Holy Friday, the um, um, on Holy Friday um, at night. Holy third day at night, actually. Uh, after the first fifth hour in the night, uh, imni uh, and mm -hmm. the opponents and all this. Uh, <clears throat> normally, in the uh, lectionaries, we have just seven lections from uh, from gospels uh, during this uh, night vigil. But in Egeria, it it says uh, like. Lectiones mm -hmm. in plural. There are gospels of instruction of the Yes, sure, sure, and uh, and we have we have just this mm -hmm. one huge yeah. part of John John's gospel. Do you have any ideas uh, no. um, if it was split in different no, parts no. and inserted after? Because it says interposite orationes. It, it, it should mean mm -hmm. that the the gospel was split it in, in some parts, probably in five parts, because you have mm -hmm. this uh, five gubalai, like mm -hmm. three psalms. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and, and here it's, it's interesting, I, I, I never mm, saw, thought it's without readings. Yes. It's yours. Um, uh, no, it's idea. the order of the Armenian lectionary. It says explicitly it's, uh, or not, or what? Because it says I, so we can look it up. Um, um, because it if it was split in five uh, in five uh, parts, you have then okay. not seven but eleven uh, gospel readings, which yeah. could correspond to eleven su Sunday readings. Yeah, that's an interesting idea. I've never um, thought about that. Um, and from this will will be my third <laughs> question, <laughs> which I have. Um, yeah. It does not explicitly state, um, but it gives. Um, a, it gives a, just it five, and then the the, yes. the gospel with I, I understand yeah. this. This is uh, this is clearly because it, it just one part. Uh, yeah. And then it says after the fifteen psalms. And the Saint Kobala, and the the frustrations and 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 the orations. Right. Uh, the same evening, but in the middle of the night, one reads the gospel in this uh, sense, in the um, according to John, mm -hmm. and then comes either thirteen sixteen or thirteen thirty one through eighteen uh, one. Yeah. So I have no. No idea um, okay, we, uh, how to reconcile um, Egeria with, with mm -hmm, this. Mm -hmm. There may have been liturgical development. Um, um, I don't know. Yes, but, and, and then my, my third question is, uh, I, I can surely understand that uh, the, in the 4th century, the, um, the baptism of catechumens was a big deal in in Jerusalem and everywhere in in uh, in the world. But to read Old Testamental readings in the Paschal Vigil uh, in this state, when you have plenty of resurrectional pericopas in, in in all four Gospels, it sounds strange. Well, it's exactly what Melito and other preachers do in, on, on Pascha. Mm -hmm. The second part of the Pascha homily of Melito is asking who is the suffering one, and, and, um, and that's not in first case Christ, mm -hmm. but it's human mankind who is suffering because of sin, mm -hmm. and Christ has compassion, and, um, and it complements... Um, a mm -hmm. typological exegesis of, of Exodus 12, mm -hmm. and then he says, well, that's not absurd, because he's prophesied both by figures of the Old Testament mm -hmm. and by types of the Old Testament, uh, by, 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 